Good morning. Good morning, everyone. My name is Matt Ewald. I'm the Texas Tribune Senior Director of Events and Live Journalism. Uh, welcome to those joining us in person and online for today's event with University of Austin founding president, Pano Canelos, interviewed by Texas Tribune Managing Editor for News and Politics, Matthew Watkins. The University of Austin was established two years ago to counter what its founders say is a culture of censorship across colleges today. This morning, we'll discuss the road to creating the university, why higher education needs a transformation, and why Austin was the right place for this mission. Today's program will run approximately an hour with 45 minutes for a conversation and 15 minutes for your questions. Here in Austin, we have mics for our in-person audience. And for our virtual audience, you can submit questions online at our Q&A portal at texastribune.org slash ask. That's texastribune.org slash ask. And as the year comes to an end, and on behalf of my Texas Tribune colleagues, I just want to thank all of those who support the impactful journalism of the Tribune, including those who have become members. To learn more and to become a member, you can visit texastribune.org slash support. I also want to very quickly highlight a couple events coming up in January. On January 10th, here in Studio 919, we'll host a panel conversation on the Texas economy, our workforce, and what's working. And on January 24th, we'll host an event on how new laws are affecting Texas community colleges. You can learn more about both events and more of our upcoming events at texastribune.org slash events. And now to our two panelists. Pano Canelos uh, is the founding president of the University of Austin from 2017 to 2021. He served as president of St. John's College in Annapolis, Maryland. During his tenure, St. John successfully launched a historic initiative that included the most significant tuition reduction at any American college, accompanied by a $300 million campaign. Previous appointments include Dean of the Honors College at Valparaiso University, Associate Professor of Theater at Loyola University, Chicago, Associate Professor of English at the University of San Diego, and a postdoctoral fellow at Stanford University. Our moderator today, Matthew Watkins, is Managing Editor of News and Politics, overseeing the day-to-day -day planning for news coverage here at the Tribune. He began working at the Tribune in 2015, and previously served as reporter covering higher education, breaking news editor, and politics editor. He also worked as a reporter at the Dallas Morning News and the Eagle in Bryan College Station. We uh, are grateful for this conversation and for Dr. Canelos to join us today. Please welcome to the stage Matthew Watkins and Pano Canelos. Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, and thank you, uh, 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 President Canellis, for being here as well. My pleasure. Um, so uh, Matt mentioned in the intro, you, prior to this job, prior to leaving to basically a university startup, you were the president of um, St. John's College, which I understand in my research is, is the third oldest university in the country, right? So that is going from you know a very very well established university to a a, a brand new thing a, a a risky venture. I wonder if you we could just start by you telling us sort of the origin story of the University of Austin. What, how did this kind of come together to to what it is building to right now? Uh, happily, um, before I do that, I want to thank everybody who's here today, coming in the rain to be part of this conversation. And, and I heard rumors that there are also many people online who are listening in or who maybe watch us later. So thank you for the attention that you're giving to higher education and University of Austin. Um, I love when people ask for the origin story because it sounds like a superhero thing, right? You get an origin story. Um, so you're right. I Look, I was president of the third oldest college in America, founded in 1696. So it's Harvard, William & Mary, then St. John's. And now I'm president of America's newest university. In fact, we are a university now. We've received our authorization from the state of Texas. Um, uh, and I think those two things in some ways go together. Um, 
one of the reasons we started this university is because America has uh, been the world's greatest place for universities to begin since its origin. In fact, St. John's started before there was a United States of America. And so part of the American story is the founding of colleges and universities. As America grew, there was always, you know, as, 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 as states grew and, and we saw westward expansion, um, every time you saw significant settlement, there was the foundation of a college or, or university. And so part of um, the dynamic of this country, the dynamic that allows us to be forward-looking and hopeful is the creation of institutions. And so, you know, I, I, I'd say one of the things that inspired us to, to get, this, uh, get this project off the ground was the sort of realization that it's been a long time since we've founded universities. For example, uh, University of Austin founded in 2023 is the first new private university founded in Texas since 1963. So that's 60 years. Texas has grown from about 10 million people in 1963 to over 30 million. So you know the growth of Texas um, seems like it would demand the growth of new institutions. So part of it is, is that dynamic, but also I think we're just living in a moment where things seem to be coming apart, where people seem to be pulled away from each other, where institutions um, seem to be sort of shaking in their foundations. I think the best possible response in times like this is to build new things and create new things. Um, as you build new things, you learn things, you build institutions that themselves aren't perfect, but maybe are capable of modeling um, you know, a better future for everyone. So the way that y'all announced this was um, in a uh, post on uh, the journalist Barry Weiss's Substack as a uh, someone who works in online journalism. I, you know, have to tip my hat to, uh, you know, a, a piece of writing that uh, spread far and wide very quickly and sparked a lot of conversation, right? This, this sort of went everywhere and it got everyone talking. And you sort of began that piece really honing in on the idea of, you know, universities maybe losing their place as a, or losing their place where, you know, heterodoxy opinions can thrive or, you know, open debate can, can go on. This is, you know, I've been excited about this event for a while, looking forward, I'm really interested in what y'all are doing, but boy, did we pick a perfect time to be talking about this topic. Tell us a little bit about what your concern is about kind of speech on campus, open exchange of ideas on campus right now, and, and how the University of Austin can, can do it differently. Um, sure thing, yes, yeah, two years ago when, we, when, when I published that piece on Barry's Substack, and like, I know nothing about social media. I've never sent a tweet in my life, and, um, but I was convinced that this would be a way to sort of, um, an appropriate way to kind of get the conversation going. Uh, I think we were the number one news story on Twitter in the world for 48 hours or something, which is remarkable. Because all we said was, hey, guys, we're getting together and building a university. I mean, it, it wasn't, um, there wasn't a university there yet. Um, and yet here we are two years later, and the very things that we pointed out at that moment in time, uh, uh, the, the need to recommit to open inquiry, intellectual pluralism, and that, um, have really come to the fore in this particular moment in, in, in the present. In fact, just this past week, Fareed Zakaria on CNN wrote a, an editorial that essentially mirrored everything that we said two years ago. So, um, so I like to think that the issues that we were raising that, and, and trying to bring the attention of the public in general are now getting even more exposure and, 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 and becoming more central to the conversation we're having. Uh, about higher education, about society at large. Um, so let, let me sort of rewind a little bit and just say um, one of the great things about starting a new university is you're really starting from scratch and, you're, and you have to ask yourself the question, what is a university? What's the purpose of a university? And then you build out from there. You have to know the, the ethos of the institution to be its mission. And you know, it seems self-evident, but maybe we need to repeat this once in a while, that the purpose of the university, of any university, is the discovery of knowledge, the transmission of knowledge, and the preservation of knowledge. And so the, the, the activities of university should be conducive to that. Um, so how do we discover things? Uh, how do we 
move the ball forward when it comes to human understanding of the world, primarily through the exchange of ideas, by testing ideas, having conversation, having dialogue. I mean, the mind in, in, is, a, is a kind of muscle. And, and to strengthen a muscle, you need tension, you need opposition. So universities should be places where um, the widest possible range of ideas are brought to the table for debate, discussion, so that, you know, so that we can um, continue <laughs> as human beings to get to know the world and ourselves better. Um, I would say, you know, one of maybe the misconceptions about what the purpose of a university is, is that somehow universities should be a forum for debate. I mean, debate has a, a very important place at a university, but it's not the highest calling of a university. A debate is when you bring two people together, different parties, that have settled ideas. And then, you know, the, the purpose of a debate is for the debaters to each present their sides with something like a victory in mind, that one side wins. Right? I don't think at a university, you know, you one opinion plus another opinion should equal two opinions, one winning out in the end. One opinion plus another opinion should equal better opinions. So ideally at a university, the process of dialogue, the process of conversation, helps us to hone our ideas, to sharpen the way we see the world, to, to, um, to change our mind, to be persuaded, to persuade others. So you know, to have that kind of, um, you know, to, to foster that kind of environment, I think is really, should be the first priority of any institution of higher learning. So, you know, the, we, we've sort of danced around this, but the, um, you know, what is in the news right now, of course, is the, the presidents of some very prestigious universities, Harvard, MIT, Penn, under a lot of heat for testimony that they gave to Congress about um, anti-Semitism on campus. And some of the answers that they were given, you know, um, I was going back through some of the, the back and forth um, last night in preparation from this, and you know, um, a, uh, a representative asking the president of Harvard about um, calls for you know, you know intifada in um, on campus, and you know whether that violates the Harvard code of conduct, and um, uh, you know the the president of Penn having a Palestinian writers conference on campus in which. Um, uh, you know, some authors who had said some some very uh, controversial things were, were were brought on campus, and also just you know a culture of where a lot of you know Jewish students on a lot of different campuses um, have faced some just downright outright anti-Semitism speeches. The the feeling there was, you know, and, and why they are feeling so much pressure is a feeling of not enough being done by those university presidents to kind of speak out, stop that kind of speech, um, all that. I wonder what your opinion is about what they are doing right and what they are doing wrong and, and what you think of the, the backlash that they're facing right now. Yes. Um, yeah, I had a feeling we'd talk about this. <laughs> uh, so um, let me approach that by saying what I think should be done at a university like ours and, and then Anybody can draw whatever conclusions they want by contrast. Um, the issue that was raised predominantly in the hearings was the issue of free speech. What are the boundaries of speech, free speech? And I think the boundaries of free speech are pretty clear. You know, uh, that speech is free and extends as far as possible up until the point where it becomes uh, threatening or intimidating or to another human being or includes the incitement for violence. And so, um, you know, the line is clearly crossed when one is advocating for genocide. I mean, that's, that's unambiguous. And I think that anybody asked that question in a public setting who's representing an institution has to be clear about that. And so I am clear about that as president of this institution. Um, Allowing space for unpopular ideas, radical dissent, uh, is essential as part of a university. Um, in fact, I was at a at event at UT last week, and I thought UT handled uh, a particular situation. I'll talk about it um, admirably. 
Uh, it was a talk, Barry Weiss uh, was on campus to give a talk, and at the beginning of the talk, it was in the LBJ Auditorium, there were a group of, I assume they were students, there were about 50, 60 people in the audience, and they all had masks on. And as soon as she started speaking, they got up and they started shouting um, Free Palestine and some other things. Um, and the, the, the campus security was there, and they came in, and they, they had made an announcement at a time that you're not allowed to disrupt um, the speech of any speaker, and, and if anybody does, they'll be escorted out. And so the students got up, they said what they had to say, they were escorted out peacefully and, and willingly by the security. They went outside, and then they continued outside to audibly um, chant and protest against what they thought was um, uh, objectionable in, in Barry's speech. That all seems totally within bounds and fair to me. I mean, the, the, the people who had something to say respected the fact that um, free speech does not allow you ultimately to um, subvert the speech of another person to prevent them from speaking, so they honored that. They went outside and they continued to express themselves. I didn't hear anything from any of them that was um, uh, in favor of anything like genocide or, or violence against other people. The situation was a bit unnerving. I mean, it's, it's a strange phenomenon to be listening to a speaker on a stage while you're hearing drums beat behind you and chants coming in. But to me, that represented, um, I think, a legitimate act of, of uh, free speech. And so, you know, navigating these things, my hats go off to UT for navigating a, a difficult situation really admirably. I, I think one of the challenges here is that there, among the group that feel that, you know, free speech is at risk on campus, there's, there's a lot of different aspects of speech on campus, right? There's, there's the speakers that a university invites to speak, and um, there is the people, you know, who may at times shout down a speaker while they're speaking. There's also, you know, what is said in class by a student. And I think that there's a feeling among, you know, I would say particularly among conservatives, not exclusively among conservatives, that there is also just a sort of chilling effect where, you know, a, a, a professor, um, you know, I would, I would point to um, Peter Bogosian, who is uh, asso associated with your school, you know, um, a real feeling where if you say something that is, um, you know, outside what is deemed acceptable by a large segment, or, or you know, maybe we can even debate how large it is, but a, a segment in a vocal segment of, of a university, you know, maybe the, the university won't, um, maybe the university won't fire you, um, maybe you're protected by tenure in that way, but maybe students will protest you students will call for your firing. Maybe you'll be ostracized by the faculty. There are all these different things that are within the rights of the objectors, you know, within their free speech rights to do, but that there is still a concern around, you know, what kind of effect it's having on speech on campus. And I think, you know, when people looked at what was being said about, um, you know, anti-Semitism by the, um, um, the, the college professors. I mean, one of the reactions by critics of those uh, university presidents, I mean, was, you know, why weren't you doing this when it was conservatives under attack? And so that to me, though, feels like a much harder thing to deal with as a college administrator, right? How is the University of Austin I mean, I guess I, should, I shouldn't say how. My first question should be, is it the goal of the University of Austin to avoid that kind of climate? And if so, what can and should a university administrator, a president such as yourself, be doing in order to create that? Um, I mean, I, you know, look, it is, uh, the data shows that a significant number of students and faculty, over two-thirds, uh, report that they feel that they're... Um, that they self-censor, that, they, that, that they have to kind of guard their opinions. Um, now, how often they do that, the data doesn't reveal, like how severe they think the penalties might be, I'm not sure, but listen, I mean, two-thirds is two-thirds, and, and so that is a significant data point. Um, look, if, if you're trying to deal with problems of, uh, let's just call it intellectual pluralism, an environment in which 
many ideas are coming together, sometimes clashing with one another. If you're trying to deal with, with these issues by, um, at the back end, by letting, <laughs> letting things happen, letting the situation get bad, and then trying to stitch things up again, uh, you've missed the fundamental opportunity of what it means to be a university. Universities have to be grounded in, founded upon principles of civil discourse, right? You have to cultivate this at a university from the ground up. We, you know, we have the advantage of being able to create a culture really from scratch. We have our own sandbox. And so making sure that we're attending as much as possible to intellectual pluralism, civil discourse, open inquiry, and putting in place both the kind of cultural pieces that will preserve that and then the governance pieces that will preserve that is really essential. Um, the bottom line is, you know, what's happening at universities is what's happening in the culture, right? The, this kind of, you know, this, this polarization, the, this, um, let's say, kind of hardening of, of empathy, like, you know, where we start to see other people as um, alien to us. I mean, this is happening in the culture. Some people will say it came from universities and then sort of bled into the culture. Some say it's rebounded back. That's a long conversation. We could think about that. But, but it's there. I think universities have a particular responsibility to be at the vanguard of fostering civil discourse, fostering open inquiry and academic freedom, because that's at the heart of intellectual inquiry and conversation. So, you know, how do you do that at a university? Well, first, you have to be very clear about what you stand for and what your principles are. And from the very beginning, we said, look, um, universities should be committed to the pursuit of truth. Uh, and the pursuit of truth is predicated upon open inquiry, upon freedom of conscience, which is very important, upon civil discourse. And then you start building out the kind of uh, the structures that will sort of preserve, protect, and promote those those parts of, of, of your institution over time. I'll give you one example. I'll give you two examples. I'm kind of, I'm kind of proud of both of these. So, um, you know, often, often we think that students who feel like they can't express themselves in the classroom are intimidated by their professors. Maybe that's the case sometimes. Um, most professors I know are pretty conscientious people and understand their role and are, are you know, want to foster ideas and that's, I mean, it, it could be, it's possible. I think students are actually more afraid of each other in the classroom. And again, this is the kind of culture that they live in where there's a kind of culture of kind of censorious social media and that. And so they're kind of on eggshells around each other because they're afraid that any moment something they say may start to ricochet across the social media universe and have significant consequences for them. So in a classroom setting where you want students to trust one another and you want them to be able to um, take intellectual risks, say stuff like just like, you know, maybe they're wrong, but just be able to put it on the table. Say like, I, you know, I've been thinking about this or I see, the, see things this way. It, am I right? Am I wrong? Put it out there, which is the heart of conversation. You have to create a, a, let's say, a circle of trust. So one of the things we're implementing at the University of Austin is a very simple thing, but I, I think it'll go a long way towards creating an atmosphere of trust. And that is uh, the Chatham House rule which is if, if Chatham House rule is that in a, in a conversational setting, all participants agree in advance that nothing that's said as part of that conversation will be repeated outside the conversation with attribution. So you could say, you know, you know I was having a conversation in class and somebody raised this point and you know, I, I found it offensive or I enjoyed it that, but you can't identify the person. So it, it de-risks it for the people involved. And if you ever do, there are severe consequences for that. You're breaking the trust. So that, I think those kinds of, you know, let's say fostering those kinds of procedural things is important. I think the other thing that's really, um, uh, you know, a, a new element that we're introducing in the university governance at University of Austin, thinking about how universities protect academic freedom and speech, is, um, you know, we have a constitution called the Constitution, right? It's a founding, so you get, to, you get to write a constitution. And what we realized in writing our constitution was, you know, the constitution enumerates all the things that University of Austin um, stands for, the things that, um, that need to be protected at a university and promoted, like any constitution. We realized in writing it is what universities don't have is a judicial branch, right? There's not a, 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 a way when, let's say, issues of academic freedom arise 
to consult somebody who's outside the institution um, to determine whether or not academic freedom has been you know, transgressed upon. So what we've created is a kind of a third branch. We have an executive and administrative branch, which is the administration, a legislative branch, which is the, you know, the, the board of trustees and the faculty senate, but we've created a judicial branch that will be comprised of people who are experts in constitutional law, free speech, academic freedom, who exist outside the university, who are volunteers, so that if a faculty member, a student, a member of the, of the staff um, believes that somebody at the university or the university itself has, um, you know, has, has somehow um, transgressed upon their academic freedom, this objective third party can determine whether or not that's a case, and the university is bound by their findings. So these are the kind of things I think you could put together in terms of governance and culture that will help protect and promote um, academic freedom. I, I think these things are easier to talk about in the abstract than they are in the specifics, right? I mean, we have seen on college campuses recently, you know, people protesting um, outside speakers, perhaps with ties to Israel, or, or, or maybe even just, uh, you know, uh, Jewish student groups and things like that. You know, people holding signs calling for intifada. Should, you know, you, you said in your letter the, um, the university is supposed to defend, citing the, uh, a Yale statement on academic freedom, the right to think the unthinkable, discuss the unmentionable, and challenge the unchallengeable. Do you think a shoot student in that, who does that, should be punished in any way, or will be punished in any what, way at the University of Austin? Can you, can you just say more about what that is? Because so, this is a very specific I mean, yeah. question. So you know, the question that uh, uh, Elise Stefanak asked at the, the conference was specifically, it was, it, it's hard to narrow down into a specific, um, because she, she talked about, you know, the, the word intifada, for instance, right? And she said, you know, that this, uh, she asked the, the, the president, President Gay, whether that was, um, that amounted to genocide, essentially, and, and the president agreed um, to that question, and then kind of, dodged a question of whether anyone calling for that is violating the Harvard Code of Ethics or anything like that. And so it's, it's a complicated to specifically sort of reenact that exact question. But I mean, it is unquestionably true that there have been people on college campuses calling for an intifada. It is also true that there is a debate, right, about like what exactly that word means, and it means different things to different people. And that's where it gets into a bit of a challenge, because you say someone calling for a genocide is so let, I, I, I want to just bring up a specific example because I feel like that is a situation where, um, you know, people have pointed to this. I mean, Barry Weiss being one of them pointed to this and say, this is a sign how academia is broken. And so I'm, I'm curious how in that situation the University of Austin would handle it. So um, thank you for the difficult question yeah. truly i mean i think these are the kind of things that we have to be very clear about and 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 think about ahead of time uh, as we're starting university um i guess what i would say is this um you know we're living in a moment where there is an inordinate amount of human suffering um and um the this is not a moment for people to be ambiguous about meaning Okay, so um, just be clear about what it is that you mean when you use words, so that the people hearing it know what you mean and can interpret it correctly. So if what you mean by antifada is, you know, um, you know, the, we believe in the, the, the fight for the rights of Palestinians um, and for all human beings to, to live and flourish and um, you know, and just as Jewish people have the right to live and flourish, Palestinians should as well. Just say that. And, you know, just come out and say that. And then those people who are hearing those words, I think, will understand your intention. But when we use words that can toggle back and forth between meanings, and we're not clear about what we mean, then the person hearing those words is, you know, not wrong to assume that maybe the worst interpretation of those is what's intended. So in times like this, we just need clarity. We need, so speech should bring clarity. Tell us exactly what you believe and why you believe it. 
and and then that that I think allows the the you know what is a very tense atmosphere um, to become an atmosphere of understanding. So that's what I would say. And you know anybody using the word intifada or things like that, everybody knows that that's a toggle word that it can mean different things. So just say what you mean. That's what I would say. The the, the challenge though, of course, becomes when it means when one person is telling you it means this to me and it made me feel as though someone was calling for violence against me and the person who uses the word says it means something differently that becomes very challenging right for answer the question i mean if yeah. somebody says like this is threatening to me and this is terrible what do you mean by that and then answer the question i mean just be clear yeah. say that's not what i mean and or if your answer is that is what i mean then we have a problem right <laughs> and, and so just be clear i mean i think you know, again, this goes back to creating communities of trust. Mm -hmm. Communities of trust have to be able to use words that make sense to one another so that we can all understand each other. And so we, ambiguity in speech leads to moral ambiguity. So I, my call to everybody is just be as clear as possible about what you're trying to say. And then, um, then you can actually open the possibility for conversation. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna move on to sort of the vision for the university long term. This is obviously building a university from scratch is a slow build. Um, I think we already mentioned that you're you're hoping to have a hundred students enrolled in fall 2024. Um, I'm curious. I, I was reading a, an article which you gave an interview with George Will, and he he was sort of paraphrasing you, but he, he you kind of had broken universities, colleges into three different categories, the, the kind of top 40 elite, the, the more like state flagship universities, which he said, you said, had become more resembling trade type schools in recent years. And then the, the sort of more open and rich uh, enrollment, um, you know, non-competitive non uh, admissions uh, type schools and things like that. I wonder, like, what is, what do you want the University of Austin to eventually become? Which of those three categories do you want to see it in? So um, if I, I remember the article, but it's been a long time since I've seen it. I, I certainly didn't say, or mean to say, maybe George interpreted this way, that, that flagship universities are trade schools. Um, uh, um, I think, I, what I, well, I, I got, I'll say what I mean uh, by this, because I remember the conversation with George, is that I think they're, you know, um, universities function in different ways. And what the elite universities promise primarily is access to power, right? So, you know, you join one of these elite universities, top 20, top 40, however they're defined, and the promise is that by becoming part of this community, you are, you are sort of entering a network that will provide you access to power. And, you know, whether that's through judicial clerkships or, you know, high-end internships in finance or that, that, um, that these institutions are less about, let's say, making money and more about the kind of uh, entering into the elite class, which can come with making money, but not always. So if power is the purpose of the elite institutions, um, the next tranche of schools, and I include lots and lots of schools, including flagships like UT, I would say that, that it's less about access to power and more about access to prosperity, right? So, you know, these schools, excellent places to learn, fantastic programs. The students who go there are primarily thinking about how can I create a life for myself in which I can prosper? That may be financial, there may be other things, but it's, you know, but there's a, there's a kind of, I mean, say maybe a slightly different orientation. Um, and then for the next tranche of schools, the vast number of schools that are out there that are, let's say are non-selective, but are open and accessible, I think primarily those are places that uh, provide upward mobility. You know, that, you know, give somebody who, like I was a first generation college student, so college was all, for me, an opportunity for upward mobility and, and provide entry points for students to come in and, um, you know, study things and learn things that will allow them to, uh, you know, take a step up the ladder of uh, social uh, and economic mobility. So I just think, you know, I think we have to be kind of honest about that, that, you know, that, you know, what elite schools are promising is kind of entry into an elite, and that's the primary mission that they have. Um, and again, at each of those levels, things could scramble, right? So, I mean, I, you know, but I think that's predominantly, what I would say is for University of Austin, um, our goal is to provide an elite level education and 
and draw elite level students, but to orient them towards prosperity. And what I mean by that is, you know, we are an institution, we're building an institution to graduate builders and, and, and creators and innovators and entrepreneurs. Like our special sauce is that not only do we think we need to build an institution because the world needs insti new institutions, but that we want to graduate young people who are committed to building and creating. So to me, you know, that's, that's a different um, promise that you're making to a young person than, than the promise of kind of entering into networks, elite networks. And, and I'll clean up my question. The, the, the actual quote that George Will wrote, not you, was increasingly vocational for the, the, the trade schools. I mean, sorry, for the, uh, the, the flagship schools. But, yeah. but I, I, you, you answered the question that I was trying to get yeah. at, is, is, is what is this... Um, what what is the the, the goal here? You um, y'all are planning to hire. I read around fifteen to twenty professors from the start. Um, a, a class of a hundred um, starting out, and I'd imagine that will will con continue to grow over time. What is the educational experience? Hope what are you hoping for that to be for a University of Austin student? So. Um Again, you have, you have an open sandbox. You're creating a curriculum, and it's both exciting and intimidating, right? Because you're setting a kind of standards for generations to come. Um, so one of the sort of um, one of the things we took very seriously is that you know an undergraduate experience is sort of mandated to be four years. That's the standard set by accreditors. Universities are 120 credit delivery systems, basically. If you want to be blunt about it, um, how do you fill those four years in ways that are to uh, maximize the experience for students and prepare them to flourish in the world. And um, so we, we kind of broke the, broke the undergraduate curriculum into three components. The first two years are primarily given over to what we call our intellectual foundations program. And the idea behind this is that you know, every, every university has this kind of general education requirements, but they tend to be kind of scattered around and students just kind of pick them based upon whether or not they want to wake up at eight in the morning or not for a particular class, you know, and, and, and they kind of assemble something, but there's no intentionality institutionally around most general ed programs. We're like, what if we took all those things that uh, a student sh should learn? Um, you know, things about, you know, the, about history, about literature, about the fundamentals of mathematics and science, about the arts and that, and what if we created a kind of curated program that every student would progress through together? So you kind of come in with your cohort. You're taking the same classes, reading the same books, discussing the same ideas together in sequence. Um, that's a very powerful model because it creates a, a common intellectual journey for the students. And it also um, gives them common points of, of experience and contact so that the entire university is now the classroom. This is, was, I, I, I'm, you know, I didn't, um, I, I borrowed this from St. John's College where students follow the same curriculum over all four years. And so um, the, the power of that model is, is, is extraordinary. So the first two years are really like, what are the things, what are the great human questions we've asked over time? What are some of the most compelling answers to those questions that human beings have come up with? Where have we got things right? Where have we got things wrong? And again, across fields, these are questions in, in the sciences, in philosophy, in, in, in aesthetics and that. Um, and how do we learn how to talk about these things in a productive way? So that's the sort of, you know, the, the first part of the experience. The latter part of the experience, primarily years three and four, is um, to move from thought into action. So students will study in areas, we have areas in social sciences, humanities, STEM, and they'll say, sort of take core programs there. But the real focus in, in what we call our academic centers of inquiry, rather than traditional departments, is to bring together scholars and practitioners, professors and uh, I'll use the word real people, I was a professor, so I could say that, people who are out in the outside world to solve problems together for the common good. So, you know, whether it's a question about education or technology or, you know, what, whatever might be politics. And so in years three or four, students become a junior fellow in one of these centers, and they become actively engaged in the kind of projects that are underway and in learning how to take knowledge from theory to, to practice, theoretical knowledge to applied knowledge. So the, the arc at, at UATX is from, you know, let's say, like high-minded, liberal, artsy, contemplative, intellectual foundations to like doing real stuff in the world. 
That's the journey. And then the through line for all of this is what we call our Polaris project. So being an institution dedicated to creating builders and innovators and, and so forth, you know, we said, well, we can't just say we're gonna do that. We actually have to do it. Like, how are you gonna actually teach young people how to do significant things for the common good? So Polaris, which is our symbol, is the North Star. We believe that you know, every institution should have a North Star, and every person who's progressing through an institution should have their own North Star. So we begin, as soon as a student arrives, asking the question, again, sort of more theoretical and philosophical, what are your greatest gifts, and how do you bring those gifts to the world's greatest need? And then over the course of four years, students are engaged in their own personal project, a moonshot project, trying to create something for the common good. It could be something technological. It could be something educational. It could be something nonprofit. Um, but we're going to work with them over four years to you know, sort of identify who they are and how they can contribute to the world, and then to start to identify how they can hone their interests and talents in a very productive way so that by the time they leave, they have really built something. I mean, it may not be a completed project, you know. And I'll, I'll give an example. This is, this is the one that I use frequently, so f forgive me if, if you've heard me speak before on this, but I just love this project. So I was talking to a young man um, who was very interested in the university, and uh, I said, okay, you're gonna have to do this Polaris project. Like, you, what are your passions? Like, how are we gonna shape your passions into some moonshot project? And, uh, and he's like, oh, Dr. Canellis, he goes, I love, I love the ancient world. I love ancient Greece and Rome and the languages. And I'm like, ooh, okay, entrepreneurial project. This is gonna be tough, you know? Um, and so we started talking and then, and, and, you know, after the point of conversation, he had, this, he had this kind of epiphany. He said, you know what? He said, I read recently that there are fewer than 100,000 people left who can still read ancient Greek. Because my project is going to be to teach 100,000 more people how to read Greek. I thought, what an amazing project. Like, how do you, how do you I imagine tackling that particular problem? You know, pedagogy, instructional format. How do you market it? How do you reach people? How do you assess it? How do you do these things well? Something driven by his passion that will teach him how to take that passion and create something for the common good. So that's, you know, I mean, this is a very distinctive component of the Polaris Project of University of Austin, and one that we're really committed to given our, our ethos. You know, one of the, in your kind of speaking about this university in your introductory letter, you raised a lot of, um, you know, problems with the world of higher education right now, many of which are, you know, in some ways kind of broadly recognized as issues, right? You talked about, um, you know, administrative bloat at, at universities, the rising cost of tuition, um, how at some, you know, kind of research powerhouses, the, the top professors are not spending a lot of time teaching, various things like that. Um, starting a brand new university from scratch allows you to address a lot of those issues. One of the big challenges that comes with that though is, I mean, the, the things that these kind of long-standing institutions have is, uh, you know, great brands, right? Like, you know, even someone who is worried about, um, you know, there are a lot of very conservative people, a lot of people who are unhappy about the state of universities who are still thrilled to send their kids to Stanford, for instance, because you then have your name associated with this elite institution for, you know, the rest of your life. And that's going to help you get a job. And I think if we're being honest in a lot of ways, that might be the biggest value for a lot of students when, when they go to a university. How do you worry at all about n not having that from the start? Is there any concern about students, you know, people who are gonna be hiring these students down the road, not knowing what the University of Austin is and, and you know, or, or skepticism about, you know, is this, is this startup university providing the, the, the type of preparation that you know, 150 year old institutions are providing? Okay, I think there are like nine questions in there. So uh, I'll start at the end and then remind me if you want for the other ones. Um, so let, let's, let's put the Stanford elite question in perspective. There are 22 million college students today. The number of students in elite institution is in, in the top like 10 or 20 schools is probably not more than 100,000 or maybe 200,000. 
So let's just put that in perspective. So in terms of the, the, the universe of higher education, there are, there are plenty of wonderful, bright students out there that any institution can attract if they have the right kind of mission. Um, and already with the applications that have been rolling in at University of Austin, I've, I've, I'm over the moon excited with the kind of applications we're getting in. So that's, um, so in terms of brand, I don't know. I mean, uh, here's, here's, here's a data point. Um, we have created at University of Austin, we call our talent network. And this is a network of companies and organizations that are signing up to have um, special access to our students so that they get first dibs on interning and apprenticing and interviewing and hiring. Right? We haven't had a student yet, or we haven't had a student in a degree program yet. Um, we're gonna have 100 students in the first class. We have over, at this point, I think 200 talent network partners signed up to hire those kids. And we've just started building the talent network. And what we're hearing from them is, look, if a kid is independent-minded and willing to jump into a founding university and wants to be a part of this, uh, you know, that's the kind of kid we want to hire, right? This is, this, is, this is somebody who's intellectually ambitious, who's risk-taking, um, who understands that for them, the value of a degree is finding the institution that's the right fit for their ambitions. And so I'm, you know, we have a very different kind of brand than the elite institutions. And I think it's one that is already resonating. Um, I mean, we have already industry partners lining up to do programs with us and curriculum. What, around the corner here, we've just partnered with the Capital Factory in town, who's going to give access not only to their facilities for our students and their activities, but to the hundreds of entrepreneurs who are there um, building things and creating things so that our students have an opportunity to work with them and, and learn how to design projects. Um, we have other industry partners across, uh, across Austin, across Texas, who are you know, um, already, even though we don't have a single student, excited about the prospect of the institution. So um, I, I think that is our brand. Our brand is we're doing things differently and we're attracting students who think differently and, and are risk taking. Um, I think that's, you know, to me, that's golden. And, and, and as you have mentioned, you've, um, or has been written about, uh, there's been a lot of interest, right? There have been a lot of faculty applications, a lot of students interested in, in participating in your summer programs and things like that as well, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, we've had, I mean, we've had over 500 students already in the programs that we've run from across the country, across the world, and, you know, 10 times as many applications for each of the spots that they had. Uh, and so that's an indicator to us of, of interest. I mean, we ran a summer program last summer for high school students here in Austin. It was our first high school program, and it was in June, I think. And I'm like, okay, who's gonna come to Austin in June? Like, this is this is. We'll just have some local kids whose parents haven't left town yet, uh, but it'll be fun. You know, we'll teach, we'll have seminars and classes, and and uh, it'll just you know kind of get us and help us to understand how to um, educate high school students. And so we had our intellectual foundations program, and uh, you know I thought like eh, maybe we'll get 30 students, 40 students. Um, we ended up with applications from 23 different states and 12 different countries. We had a family fly in from Seoul, Korea, to do our program. Um, we had families from many different countries and, and states and that. And you know what that told us in that moment was that um, the distinctive quality of this emerging university is something that is in high demand you know, across the country and the world. So that was very encouraging to us. And faculty, um, in the weeks after we made the first announcement that you've referred to, I think we had you know, 4,000 faculty from other institutions reach out asking about jobs at the university. I think we're over 6,000 now, maybe even higher. I, I hesitate to say that because I don't want to discourage any wonderful faculty out there from applying. Still apply, please. We're hiring, uh, hiring now. But um, this, you know, this project is really resonating with students and with faculty. And it's our job to deliver, right? And we're ma we, you know, it's the promises we're making about you know, creating an institution that's um, that 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 rises above politics, um, that allows for rigorous debate and speech, um, that presents opportunities for students to grow into who they are and and flourish in the world. Those are big promises, and so we feel a lot of responsibility around this. So, you know, our goal is to get as much right as possible, and uh, and 
you know, that's, that's, you know, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to keep ourselves, we're going to hold ourselves accountable for this. I, I have no doubt about your sincerity around, um, you know, rigorous debate and, and things like that. Do you worry at all, though, about attracting a different kind of intellectual monochrome? Like, if, if, if it's only people who are fed up with the way the discourse is going on the elite universities now, are you just going to attract too much of, the simil of a similar type of person for, for this university as well? I mean, if the premise is that come to this university and you're going to be confronted with people who disagree with you in a civil way, that you know, people who are looking for a, a different kind of echo chamber are not going to find that very appealing. Right, and making sure that we actually cultivate that environment. Look, in the classes we've run so far, as I said, we've had over 500 students. That dynamic has not been evident at all. I mean, we've had students from across the political spectrum, across you know, uh, you know, different belief systems, different backgrounds, and that. I mean, we've, it really has been a, a totally heterogeneous group of students and faculty. And uh, but we have to maintain that. I mean, I think again, these are the things you attend to. You know, that if this is your mission. You have to ensure that that you are going to cultivate that kind of community. Will the University of Austin have diversity DEI initiatives? <laughs> no, um, but let me explain that. I mean, it's just people have throw these terms around, and, and I'm not accusing you of this, but like you know, in 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 the most simplistic way, here's how I feel. Um, the DEI, in some sense, is an attempt to bureaucratize moral behavior, right? To sort of identify what's right and wrong and then channel that behavior through an administrative apparatus, okay? That's not the right way to handle these things, all right? Solzhenitsyn said that the, the, the line between, the line separating good and evil runs through every human heart. Okay, for us to really be moral agents, to understand what's right and wrong and then act accordingly, is the point of education itself. This is why you have discussions, why you read books, why you take intellectual risks, why you learn empathy in the course of conversation. All right, and so to take, to, to, to outsource that to a bunch of administrators, to me, is to undermine the very purpose of education. Um, so, you know, <laughs> you know, I, I don't, I don't think um, DEI initiatives have been have achieved. Even, even though I think almost every person who is a DEI administrator, maybe all of them, are well-intentioned, sincere people. I, I've, I really haven't encountered anybody who's not. I don't know that their intentions have played out over time. I think passing anything through a bureaucratic system um, ultimately becomes a process of coercion rather than persuasion. So how do, you, how do you actually make sure that students are learning how to become moral agents through the process of education? That's, I think, the ultimate goal. Yeah, I mean, we have heard, though, I, I, I don't think there's any question that there are times that you know, some things that can cause people to self-censor is concern about backlash to what they say or anything like that. But I mean, you also hear about situations where if a student feels like they're being tokenized or if they feel like they are the only person in a room full of different people who represents their background, that that can cause them to sort of go silent and, or not engage in a debate as well. Well, if you're cultivating the right culture of conversation, then that person is able to express that in the room. I mean, that's the whole point. Right, and, and so if you have that circle of trust and you can express that in the room, that's how you will find a way to get these things. If you have to sort of you know, report it to an office and there has to be some kind of in administrative intervention, that probably makes things worse, I would imagine. So you know, creating a culture of trust and conversation is, I think, the, the, the best possible way to deal with any kind of, um, you know, any sense that somebody's alienated uh, intellectually, culturally, or otherwise, to remember that you know, the, the, the reason we have universities is to gather people together to together discover knowledge, to live the life of the mind together, and that we all have equal dignity. We're all, you know, we, we are all, um, I like to say, creatures of logos. We all have the powers of reason, reason and exercising those together 
I think is, again, a way to, to, to hone our moral compass. One last question, and then we will go to the audience for any questions, uh, either online or in the room. Um, but I wanted to just ask, why Austin? I mean, the, the simple question is, why not? I mean, where else would you want to build a university? I mean, especially a university with our ethos, right? You're a university dedicated to innovation and entrepreneurship and building. I mean, Austin is the epicenter of that universe. Right now, there's so many people coming from across the country, across the world here to build new things, to, to, to bring their ideas and kind of have them sort of intersect and clash with other, uh, uh, you know, other people and the things that they're working on. I mean, Austin is one great big maker space. And so that's where you want to put a new university, especially a university with, with our you know, particular calling, let's say. I also love the fact that Austin is... Um, let's call it politically fluid, all right? Uh, you know, to build a university it's a, in a red city in a red state or a blue city in a blue state is a loss of opportunity. But to be in a place like Austin where I really do feel, I've lived all over the country, all over the world, I do think that um, conversations are possible here across differences and actually are kind of normalized here in a way that you rarely find elsewhere. And so I think that's, to me, that's a very, an environment very conducive to the kind of mission that we have. All right, so we have uh, Matt Ewalt here with questions from online, but if anyone in the room would like to ask a question too, um, you can uh, uh, get behind him on the, the microphone right there. So, but go ahead, Matt. Great, well, as, uh, as we have some audience members uh, here gather for questions, just a reminder for those joining online that you can ask your questions at texastribune.org slash ask, and we'll go over just a few minutes today so we can get to a few questions, thanks. Hello, my name is Glenna Williams. I have several uh, LGBT high school acquaintances who had initially had their minds made up they're going to the University of Texas, and because of legislation, that's no longer a given. What should I be telling them about the University of Austin? Um, I would tell them that the, the, the most important human attribute they have is their mind, and that we are a community of minds coming together. That's what I would say simply. And that as, uh, as creatures of logos there, welcome at the University of Austin to join the conversation. Hi. Um, so first of all, thank you for your talk. Um, it was fascinating. I've been very interested in the University of Austin since it was announced. Um, so my question is about, um, I guess, the heterodox group that helped found the university and is still associated with it. Um, for some background, I actually I work for a group called the Foundation Against Intolerance and Racism, FAIR, who's founded by many of the, I'm sure you're familiar with them, founded by a lot of the same people and associated with them. Um, one of the problems that we've faced um, and continue to is just in our trying to make connections with people and build bridges is we sometimes are discounted or just automatically is being just or put in a box, I guess, because of that group of heterodox thinkers that you know helped found the organization and were associated with. Um, so my question is, do you think that uh, do you think that it's something that University of Austin should try to do to? Um, you know, dispel the idea that, um, you know, that you're defined by that group of thinkers and um, thereby, like, you shouldn't be attracting, like, people from all over the spectrum and all sorts of ideas. And if you do think that it's a goal of yours to dispel that, how would you go about doing it? Yeah, look, no, nobody wants to create a college of the canceled, right? Like, that's not the point. Um, the reason we, we let off with what, what you're identifying as heterodox thinkers is a, a lot of these people were also like us raising some of the fundamental concerns that were um, sort of at the origin of the university. Um, some of them, like Peter Bogosian, had you know literally been persecuted. I mean, Peter Bogosian, if you don't know his story, he, he, he's a, a man of, uh, uh, of the far left who essentially pranked a bunch of academic journals and wrote fake 
journal entries and got them published in in these journals, and it offended a lot of people in higher education. Um, he became a target at his own school for significant harassment. His office was set on fire. Uh, he's uh, charges were trumped up against him. It was really terrible. So in in the early days, there were a lot of people around the project. And again, you know, we had dozens and dozens of people affiliated with the project. Very few of whom I would say fall in that category of the heterodox being canceled, but some high profile people. It was us just sort of making a statement that you know other institutions are have become hostile to people who might be pushing boundaries or heterodox, we're open to that. Um, so that's part of it. And just in terms of the, the range, I mean, you know, on our advisory board, we have everybody from like the world's most famous atheist, Richard Dawkins, to people who are, you know, arch religious traditionalists like Sora Bamari, and yet they all feel connected to the same institution. So I think that is a, a kind of statement about, let's say, the, the, the latitude of the kind of people that we're, we're suggesting. But but now as we kind of get in the hiring and you see the faculty we're hiring, you know, what we're really hiring around faculty are people who are wonderful teachers committed to our mission, um, who are gonna, who themselves wanna help us build an institution. So uh, that's the focus. And um, yeah, I hope that's helpful. Before we go to the next question, I just wanna say we've got a good number of people queued up. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna cut it off at the end of the line here. If, uh, if you're not in line, this is, don't get in line. <laughs> I loved what you had to say about differing views not having to be a zero-sum game, but that different view plus different view can be a new view. Given what you said about that, over the 300 plus years of higher education in America, can you point to a time or instances where opinion plus opinion meant new opinion, or do you think UATX is kind of on the forefront of that? I'm curious to hear what you have to say. and I kind of have a second question, which is just about, I used to work in higher education administration, so I was familiar with the ins and outs of tier one status in AAU. How do you see organizations like these in the future of UATX? Do you think they're just bureaucratic nonsense, or do you think they have a place, or how do you, I'm just curious uh, how you see that. Thank you again. Thank you. I don't want to get myself in trouble with any organization that I'm going to have to apply to in the future, so I'll be, I'll be ginger about that. Look, I do think Higher education in general is overly bureaucratized. I mean, it's not the only sector that is. So I think the more that we can streamline um, things like accreditation and authorization so that we can have more new institutions, like that that should be a goal. Because I think in, new institutions create competition and, and, and just keep everything moving in the right direction. Um, your first question was, oh, about um, whether or not this is something completely novel, this ability to sort of bring people together in conversation. No, I think I think for the, I think for the in the history of higher education, let, let's call it let, let's let's call it what we're putting forward is sort of the liberal mindset that believes in the exchange of ideas and persuasion and that versus an illiberal mindset which is really about um, you know circumscribing what could be said or what can be expressed. I think from the history of most of higher education, the liberal mindset has dominated. Um, you know, read the history of the University of Chicago, which was where I did my PhD. I mean, to this day, I think institutions like that are places where ideas come together and create better ideas. So, um, but sometimes you have to renew the spirit of something. And so I think that's part of our mission. It's like, hey, hey higher ed, this is, this is mission critical. So let's renew the spirit of what's truly liberal uh, which, which truly open uh, in, in higher education. Hi, uh, I'm Julia Brookins. I work with the American Historical Association. I had a question about the role of disciplines at the University of Austin. And I, when you say intellectual pluralism, I, f I feel like the fundamental unit of intellectual pluralism at universities for a long time has been the discipline, and, and that it allows students and faculty to achieve kind of a methodological sophistication and to kind of give a structure to the instruction itself to take students who weren't pre-educated and actually get them to a different level. And I was wondering uh, what role disciplines would play if you only have 15 faculty and, and what the instruction might look like. Um, we'll only have 15 faculty in the first year. Obviously, we're going to grow to a much larger faculty as we grow over time. Um, I guess the, the, the way that I see this, and I have my own discipline, my field is um, uh, drama and English. I'm a Shakespearean, and I've uh, uh, have really found that fulfilling over the course of my career to have that. Um, I think 
the, the disciplines that we have that are kind of nested in departments at universities today um, are better served by coming into contact with other disciplines. So interdisciplinarity, I think, is a way to continue to keep the conversations within disciplines alive and, um, and is generative. So you know, rather than have departments that are um, siloed off around particular disciplines, trying to create as much cross-pollination as possible, I think is important. Also because I think you know, you're 100% right that dis disciplines create a kind of like a, a core set of competencies and knowledge for students. They very rarely line up with what students want to do with the rest of their life. So you know, 70 plus percent of people in the world today, in the US today I should say, are working in fields that they didn't major in in college. Um, if we surveyed the room, I, I bet you that's the case in the room here. Um, so, you know, for most people who aren't going to circle back and become a scholar or become, uh, a, you know, a, a member of a particular guild or that, um, using disciplinarity in a kind of um, flexible way to sort of open up the pursuit of knowledge rather than focus on a kind of scholarly set of pursuits, I think is appropriate. Hi, good morning. Hi. This is morning. an interesting conversation. Um, I'm Abena Osewa Sari. I teach, uh, I'm a professor of history at University of Texas, Austin, and also professor of population health at the Dell Medical School. Uh, so my question relates to Julia's question also. Hearing you talk is exciting, it's disruptive. It reminds me a lot of the founding of the Dell Medical School, where there's that sense of like one of the first new medical schools, a lot of potential, but then you got the students and you got the docs in and everybody wanted to work at what they thought a medical school was or in what they thought was a hospital. Um, they didn't want to call everyone by their first name and a lot of the early plans kind of slipped away and most of the people who set it up left after like five or 10 years. Uh, so I'm interested to see what happens. So to that point, I guess I'm curious uh, what kind of affiliation you expect to have with the University of Texas at Austin. For example, will students be able to take classes there? Um, will uh, you perhaps consider like a speaker series that would be able to bring in people, I don't know, like Hillary Clinton or someone like that who could kind of create that generative conversation you're hoping for beyond the 15 faculty, beyond the 100 students. Um, I would propose maybe a speaker series that would be uh, co-located both at University of Austin and University of Texas at Austin. I, look, I, I, I love being a neighbor to UT Austin. I mean, the resources there are incredible, the faculty, the students, and we are actively seeking ways to uh, help our students sort of um, utilize the resources there and provide resources in both directions. We already have faculty collaborations going on. We ran a, a program over last summer for PhD students on philosophy and the enlightenment that was a joint program between UT and UATX. So we're really open and eager to these things. Um, you know, we are, uh, if, I, if I could tell a quick story, some of you may have heard this, but one of the first visits I, I had when I came to town is I went over and met Jay Hartzell, the president of UT, and, and I said, Jay, he his office, you know, I said, Jay, I've got some news for you. You take it as you will. I said, we're, we're starting a new private university in your backyard. And he's like, nah, he's like, that's fine. He's like, he wasn't ruffled, you know, they're UT, like, we're, we're not going to worry about it. He's like, that's fine. And then I said, well, it's a little more complicated, Jay. We're, we're going to call ourselves University of Austin, and that might be confusion, UT Austin, at least in the beginning until we get settled. And he winced a little bit, and he said, nah, you know, that's okay, that's, that's okay. He goes, Pano, I have only one question for you. So what he, he's like, are you going to have a football team? <laughs> <laughs> and so I promised we would not have a football team. So we're going to cheer for the Longhorns. Uh, but yeah, cross, look, cross institutional collaboration is essential, I think. And you know, um, I know I've sort of maybe gave the impression that like I've, I've, I've dumped a little on elite universities, but I'm going to use this analogy. Um, I think every great cosmopolitan city has a, a wonderful flagship university. It's a state university and a wonderful private university uh, that's national and international its orientation. So what we would aspire to be in that relationship would be the sort of Stanford to UT's Berkeley or something like that. Thank you for your talk. Um, do you think that a university has a responsibility to try to orient or instill values in its students or just to allow them to orient themselves? Like, do you think there's any morally instructive role for an institution like the University of Austin? Absolutely. Um, 
Yes. Uh, I mean, it's, and what I would say the morally instructive role is that um, it, it aligns with the purpose of universities themselves. That human beings are, as I said, creatures of logos. We understand the world through language, through conversation. Um, and coming together to better understand the world requires that we have certain, we cultivate certain kind of virtues. Um, and I would say the virtues around conversation or discourse are, I would identify three that I think are essential. Uh, the first is intellectual humility, right? We're all on this planet for a very short while. We're always trying to figure things out. We actually know very little. I mean, you know, I have a PhD. I spent my whole career in higher education. Like, I don't know how to send a tweet, okay? We know very little in the world. And so we come together to enhance our knowledge. But you have to begin by recognizing that, that intellectual humility is the starting point. I think the second virtue to cultivate is an absolute insistence upon all the dignity of all human beings. Um, again, because we're equal together as, as these kind of logos-bearing people, people who have rationality, people who are capable of flourishing. And so um, absolutely um, committing to that. And the third is a passion for truth. Right, you have to have a passion for truth. You have to, especially if you're part of a truth-seeking institution, you have to say, I don't know very much, and getting to understand the world is very difficult, and I'm often gonna be wrong, but I need to be propelled forward by that North Star, that thing out there that is, that, that is that it's true. You know, what is, what is truth? We may never get there. We may twist and turn along the way, but universities are truth-seeking institutions, so the members of universities have to be committed passionately to the pursuit of truth. So some, those are some of the virtues I think you have to cultivate at a university. I have to say these were some uh, really great audience questions. I was uh, <laughs> very pleased. So thank you, everyone, for joining us and for participating. And thank you uh, for being here. It was a, it was a great conversation. Well, my pleasure. Thank you, and thanks to everybody in the audience and online as well. Thank you very much.